It's my pleasure. Please welcome Richard Dawkins. <laughs> I bring greetings from that little-known region, the rest of the world, <laughs> in congratulating America on getting rid of the worst president in living memory. <laughs> we too in Britain have got rid of his comrade in arms, comrade in faith, Tony Blair. Um, you might wonder what's happened to Tony Blair since he disappeared. Well, uh, he has uh, founded the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. Uh, he's now showing up in his true colors, which explains uh, his great affinity for George W. Bush. Um, they share a Christian faith, uh, and he now, Tony Blair, now thinks that Faith is the key to the future of the world, civilization, and world peace. Uh, a document has fallen into my hands, uh, which is a letter from the chief fundraiser of Tony Blair's new foundation. Uh, and uh, I thought I would begin by, this is gonna be a kind of four part uh, talk. Okay. Uh, this is the letter from the chief fundraiser of Tony Blair's foundation, which has unexpectedly fallen into my hands. <laughs> Dear person of faith, basically, oh, I should explain, Tony Blair was always famous for loving with it trendy jargon. Uh, he loves using words like cool and office speak like thinking out of the box and <laughs> phrases, you know the kind of thing. Dear person of faith, basically I write as fundraiser for the wonderful new Tony Blair Foundation whose aim is to promote respect and understanding about the world's major religions and show how faith is a powerful force for good in the modern world. I would like to touch base with you on six key points from the recent New Statesman piece by Tony, as he likes to be called by everybody, of all faiths, or indeed of none, for that's how tuned in he is. <laughs> my faith has always been an important part of my politics. Yes, indeed, although Tony modestly kept stum about it when he was prime minister. As he said, to shout his faith from the rooftop, rooftops might have been interpreted as claiming moral superiority over those with no faith, and therefore no morals, of course. <laughs> also, some might have objected to their leader taking advice from voices only he could hear. <laughs> but hey, reality is so last year compared with private revelation, isn't it? What else other than shared faith could have brought Tony together with his friend and comrade in arms, George, mission accomplished Bush. <laughs> in their life-saving and humanitarian intervention in Iraq. Admittedly, there are one or two problems remaining to be ironed out there. But all the more reason for people of different faiths, Christian and Muslim, Sunni and Shia, to join together in meaningful dialogue to seek common ground. Just as Catholics and Protestants have done so heartwarmingly throughout European history. <laughs> It is these great benefits of faith that the Tony Blair Foundation seeks to promote. We are focusing on five main projects initially, working with six partners in the six main faiths. Yes, I know, I know, it's a pity we had to limit ourselves to six, but we do have boundless respect for other faiths, all of which in their colorful variety enrich human lives. In a very real sense, we have much to learn from Zoroastrianism and Jainism, and from Mormonism, though Cherie says we need to go easy on the polygamy and the sacred underpants. <laughs> then again, we mustn't forget the ancient and rich Olympian and Norse traditions, 
although our modern blue skies thinking out of the box has pushed the envelope on shock and awe tactics and put Zeus's thunderbolts and Thor's hammer in the shade. <laughs> we hope in phase two of our five-year plan to embrace Scientology and Druidic mistletoe worship, which, <laughs> in a very real sense, have something to teach us all. In phase three, our firm commitment to diversity will lead us to source new networking partnership opportunities with the many hundreds of African tribal religions. Sacrificing goats may present problems with the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, but we hope to persuade them to adjust their priorities to take proper account of religious sensibilities. <laughs> we are working across religious divides towards a common goal, ending the scandal of deaths from malaria. Plus, of course, we mustn't forget the countless deaths from AIDS. This is where we can learn from the Pope's inspiring vision. It, <laughs> expounded recently on his visit to Africa. Drawing on his reserves of scientific and medical knowledge, informed and deepened by the values that only faith can bring, His Holiness explained that the scourge of AIDS is made worse, not better, by condoms. His advocacy of abstinence may have dismayed some medical experts, and the same goes for his deeply and sincerely held opposition to stem cell research. But surely to goodness we must find room for a diverse range of opinions. All opinions, after all, are equally valid, and there are many ways of knowing spiritual as well as factual. That, at the end of the day, is what the Tony Blair Foundation is all about. We have established Face to Faith, an interfaith schools program to counter intolerance and extremism. The great thing is to foster diversity, as Tony himself said in 2002, when challenged by a rather intolerant member of parliament about a school in Gateshead in the north of England, teaching children that the world is only 6,000 years old. Of course, you may think, as Tony himself happens to, that the true age of the world is 4.6 billion years. But excuse me, in this multicultural world, we must find room to tolerate and indeed actively foster all opinions. The more diverse, the better. We are looking to set up video conferencing dialogues to brainstorm our differences. By the way, that Gateshead School ticked lots of boxes when it came to exam results which just goes to show. Children of one faith and culture will have the chance to interact with children of another, getting a real sense of each other's lived experience. Cool. <laughs> and thanks to Tony's policy of putting as many children as possible in faith schools where they can't befriend kids from other backgrounds, the need for this interaction and mutual understanding has never been so strong. You see how it all hangs together? Sheer genius. <laughs> so strongly do we support the principle that children should be sent to schools that will identify them with their parents' beliefs, we think there is a real opportunity here to broaden it out. In phase two, we look to facilitate separate schools for postmodernist children Levisite children, and Saussurian structuralist children. <laughs> and in phase three, we shall roll out yet more separate schools for Keynesian children, monetarist children, and even neo-Marxist children. <laughs> Finally, we are working with the Coexist Foundation and Cambridge University to develop the concept of Abraham House. I always think it's so important to coexist, don't you, with our brothers and sisters of the other Abrahamic faiths. Of course, we have our differences. I mean, who doesn't, basically? But we must all learn mutual respect. For example, we need to understand and sympathize with the deep, deep hurt and offense that a man can feel if we insult his traditional beliefs by trying to stop him beating his wife <laughs> or setting fire to his daughter or cutting off her clitoris and please don't let's hear any racist or Islamophobic objections to these important expressions of faith. We shall support the introduction of Sharia courts, but on a strictly voluntary basis, only for those whose husbands and fathers freely choose it. 
The Tony Blair Foundation will work to leverage mutual respect and understanding between seemingly incompatible faith traditions. After all, despite our differences, we do have one important thing in common. All of us in the faith communities hold firm beliefs in the total absence of evidence, which leaves us free to believe anything we like. <laughs> so at the very least, we can be united in claiming a privileged role for all these private beliefs in the formulation of public policy. <coughs> I hope this letter will have shown you some of the reasons why you might consider supporting Tony's foundation. Because, hey, let's face it, a world without religion doesn't have a prayer. <laughs> With so many of the world's problems caused by religion, what better solution could there possibly be than to promote yet more of it? Yours in a very real sense, sincerely. Well, that's the end of the document that... Um, I now want to turn to part two. By the way, the, the part that I think might be really important is part four, and I hope I get time to get to it, uh, which is um, I thought it might be helpful to have a, a, an extended question and answer session on evolution and creationism and how to deal with creationists, because this may be something that many of you need to do. Maybe you need to have arguments with creationists rather often, and you may have questions about evolution that I might be able to help to answer. So I, I hope to get to part four. Uh, part two is quote mining. Uh, I'm going to begin with an example, quite a well-known one, from Charles Darwin. Darwin, faced with the complexity of the eye, said, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, that famous quotation was always going to be a prime candidate for quote mining, omitting, of course, the words that immediately follow it. Yet reason tells me. <laughs> I think you know it, um, and you can read it anyway. Using Yahoo's search engine, I have just searched the World Wide Web for I freely confess absurd in the highest degree and obtained 2,890 hits. For comparison, I then searched for if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex I, which is from the following passage, and obtained only 1,550 hits. The former phrase has been quoted nearly twice as often as the latter. Let's call this a mining index of two. It's actually quite a modest mining index. The Cambrian explosion, as you probably know, is an event in the history of life, in the fossil history, in which it appears that about half a billion years ago, a little bit more, most of the great animal phyla rather suddenly appear in the fossil record. Needless to say, creationists love it because it looks to them as though that was, there was nothing before that. These phyla just suddenly sprang into existence. In The Blind Watchmaker, I wrote, I was young and foolish in those days and not aware of the potential for quote mining, I wrote that, that the majority of animal phyla, we find them, quote, already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I went on to say, needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Well, I was savvy enough, evidently, to realize that creationists would love it, but not in 1986, savvy enough to know that they would gleefully quote my lines back at me in their own favor, carefully admitting what followed, which was a rather lengthy explanation of the Cambrian explosion and about how, in fact, it must have been preceded by a very long period of evolutionary history. I went on to say, 
Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record. Well, I uh, did my quote mining index calculation on this as well. Uh, I took the phrase, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I subjected that phrase to Yahoo's search engine and got 1,250 hits. I then looked at the next bit. <laughs> Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record and got 63 hits. This gives a mining index, 1250 divided by 63 of nearly 20, 19.8. I want now to introduce a special kind of quote mining which I think you'll recognize uh, when you see it. I call it Mining the Eddington Concession. Sir Arthur Eddington was a famous British astronomer and, uh, I've, and also a popularizer of science. I've used this quotation often for other purposes. I'm going to read it one more time. Eddington was trying to emphasize the unique almost importance of the second law of thermodynamics and he chose to do it in this way. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> Notice the rhetorical device that Eddington is using here. Clearly, he wasn't seriously intending to cast doubts on Maxwell's equations, nor on the competence of experimental physicists. Precisely the opposite. Eddington's manifest respect for Maxwell's theorizing and for experimental, experimental physicists was designed to highlight his final extolling of the unbudgeable veracity of the second law of thermodynamics. That rhetorical device is what I am naming the Eddington concession. If a journalist, say, reading the Eddington quotation announced to the world that Sir Arthur Eddington is skeptical of Maxwell's equations, or Sir Arthur Eddington thinks experimental physicists are all bunglers, that would be mining the Eddington concession. Under the auspices of an American religious foundation in October 2008, I had a public debate in Oxford with a Christian apologist, an Irish mathematician called John Lennox. A couple of days later, the same John Lennox went up to Scotland to Inverness, where he spoke to a large audience and he quoted the recent Oxford debate with me. But finally, and this is the grand irony, I was stunned last Tuesday night, completely stunned, by this. Richard Dawkins started off by saying that he'd no difficulty with the concept of Einstein's God. Now, he says this in his book. Einstein's God, that is, in some sense, the laws of nature or something like this, which is interesting because it shows that he senses there's a need for an explanation of the beginnings of things. We asked him directly, how did it all begin? He doesn't know. So it's a matter of faith, whether it's blind or not, you must judge, for him, that there's a purely naturalistic explanation of it. But the very fact that he would talk about Einstein's God even in his book fascinated me. But now came the stunning revelation. And I, I missed it in one sense. And when the lecture was over, I realized what he'd said. He said, a good case could be made for the deistic God. Well, that's staggering. Because that's exactly what happened to Anthony Flew not long ago. Anthony Flew is a philosopher who used to have Dawkins place in the world as the world's most famous atheist, a world expert in the philosophy of David Hume, who comes from Scotland, as all of you know. And Anthony Flew, at a high age, has become convinced 
of deism. That is, there is a God who started it all off. And what convinced him? DNA and its complexity, the nature of its complexity, not just that it's complex. This glass of water is complex, ladies and gentlemen. It's the semiotic nature of the complexity. And yet here is Richard Dawkins last Tuesday saying, a good case can be made for a deistic God. But look what that does with his argument. From simple to complex. Deism says there must have been a God in the beginning to start it off because it's too complex. I don't know where the argument is going to go next, but I was utterly fascinated at this apparently new concession. Anthony Flew has moved a very long way. If Dawkins now believes that a good case can be made for deism, then it seems to me that knocks the heart out of his argument about complexity here. But we're not finished yet. Now, let's go back to the Oxford debate of a few days earlier, and I hope once again you'll forgive me for playing an actual recording of a minute or so of what I said there, so that you can see what John Lennox was doing mining the Eddington concession. The question for debate in Oxford was, has science buried God? And the chairman began by putting it to me point blank. As we begin, is has science buried God? Well, which God? I mean, we could take Einstein's God, which is not really a personal God at all, but which is a sort of uh, poetic metaphor for the mystery, that which we don't understand about the universe. We could take a deist god, a sort of god of the physicists, a god of somebody like Paul Davies, who devised the laws of physics, god the mathematician, uh, god who put together the cosmos in the first place and then sat back and watched everything happen. Uh, and that would be, a, the deist god would be one that I think it would be, one could make a reasonably respectable case for that, not a case that I would um, accept, but I think it is a serious discussion that we could have. The third kind of God is one of which there are thousands and thousands of varieties, Zeus and Thor and Apollo and Amun-Ra and Yahweh. And uh, we don't actually need to go through all those because I've, um, as Larry has said, I've encountered John Lennox before and I know what he, the, the God he believes in, which is the Christian God. So we only have to talk about the Christian God. John Lennox is a scientist who believes that Jesus turned water into wine. A scientist who believes that Jesus somehow influenced all those molecules of H2O and introduced proteins and carbohydrates and tannins and, and alcohol and turned it into wine. He believes that Jesus walked on water. I had been accustomed to debating with sophisticated theologians and I come across John Lennox, who is a scientist who believes in all those things. In particular, he believes that the creator of the universe, the God who devised the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the physical constants, who devised the parsecs of space, billions of light years of space, billions of years of time, that this paragon of physical science, this genius of mathematics, couldn't think of a better way to rid the world of sin than to come to this little speck of cosmic dust and have himself tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. That is profoundly unscientific. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. It's petty and small-minded. And that's the God that John Lennox believes in. Now, I, I, I think you get the point. I was precisely doing an Eddington concession. I was saying you could perhaps make a case for a deistic God, one that I wouldn't accept. But that at least is an argument that we could have a, a serious argument about. We could actually talk about that. That would be something that we, we, would, we, could, we could have a scientific disagreement about, perhaps. But I didn't need to do that because I already knew that John Lennox believed that Jesus turned water into wine, walked on water, etc. 
I was deliberately making the Eddington concession about deism in order to show up, by contrast, the fatuousness of this man's beliefs. And yet see what he did. He took the Eddington concession, went up to Scotland two days later, and said that I was being converted to deism like <laughs> Anthony Flew. And now here's somebody else quote mining in similar vein. Uh, I, at that time, had never heard of Ben Stein, and I was, um, I had been duped uh, by a man called Mathis into taking part in a film which I thought was a serious um, exploration of science and religion, that's what I was told. Uh, I only much later discovered that it was a creationist front, uh, and that I had been fooled into doing something that I would never normally have done. When I spoke to Ben Stein, I took him seriously. I thought he was, well, until the end of that interview, as you saw. Um, I've, and when he asked me that question, um, something like, could you ever imagine any kind of intelligent design? I bent over backwards to try to give intelligent design its best shot. Its best shot for me was uh, something like designed by an alien intelligence, something like what Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel had proposed as directed panspermia. 
I don't believe in that, I didn't believe in that, I never said I did believe in that, but I was trying to bend over backwards to give intelligent design its best shot. I was actually being even more generous than that because uh, knowing at the time uh, nothing about Ben Stein and just trying to give my, my, my honest opinion, I recalled that Dembski, the leading theorist of intelligent design, at a time when he was trying to distance himself from creationism, they, they are of course all straight down the line Christian creationists, but nevertheless um, it was at a time when for political reasons in American educational politics, Dembski was anxious to distance intelligent design from creationism and he tried to help that distancing along by protesting that the intelligent designer doesn't have to be God, it could be an alien from outer space. Dembski said that. I actually remembered that when Ben Stein asked me that question and I thought I was actually offering Dembski an olive branch by acknowledging his admittedly disingenuous suggestion that the intelligent designer might not be God, but might be an alien from outer space. So the quote mining in that case was even worse than uh, it, it appears. Now, I do think that the question of is there life elsewhere in the universe is a genuinely interesting question, and one that actually has theological implications. Along with most scientists, I believe the answer to the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe, is probably yes. Although unlike most scientists, I do have an argument for suggesting that it might be, that life on this planet might be literally unique. I'm a bit out on a limb there. Most scientists think there must be life elsewhere in the universe. How rare actually is life in the universe? What if it is so staggeringly rare that we literally are the only life form in the entire universe? As I said, I don't think that's likely, but we can't rule it out. We have absolutely not got the knowledge, not got the information to rule out the possibility that life on this planet is literally unique. There is no life elsewhere in the universe. It does have an interesting implication. Since the number of available planets is up in the billions of billions, it would follow that if life has arisen only once, the likelihood of arising on any planet is staggeringly low, and therefore, when we on this planet speculate as chemists, more or less has to be chemists, speculate as chemists, on how life on this planet might have started, we would have to be looking for a theory of the origin of life so vanishingly improbable as to qualify by the ordinary standards of human judgment as impossible. It obviously wasn't totally impossible because here we are. We do, as a matter of fact, exist. But if this planet is the only planet that has life, then we are totally wasting our time looking for a good theory, a plausible theory, a likely theory for the origin of life. Because the theory of the origin of life that we would have to be looking for would need to be the kind of theory that we would ordinarily rule out as ludicrous, ridiculous, impossible. In 1950, the great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi was having lunch at Los Alamos with two colleagues from the Manhattan Project, and he suddenly said, where is everybody? And his physicist colleagues knew what he meant. Why have we not been visited by a superior civilization from outer space? Now, the intuitive calculations that Fermi and his colleagues were making when they wondered why we hadn't been visited, those calculations were based on what's called the principle of mediocrity. We used to think that the Earth was the center of the universe. 
Then we thought the sun was the centre of the universe. Then we thought the Milky Way was the entire universe. Now we know, or do we, what do we know? From our point of view, the point of the principle of mediocrity, the point is that we've had our fingers burned before in history whenever we made parochial assumptions based on our immediate surroundings. The principle of mediocrity is the antidote to the temptation to think there's something special about us. We apply the principle of mediocrity to the origin of life, and we conclude that there must be life elsewhere, because why should this planet be so special? But in that case, Fermi wondered, where is everybody? There is a loophole, which is that the origin of life might not be all that improbable, but the origin of technological life, the sort of life that's capable of visiting us, either in person or by radio, that that constitutes a larger barrier. I've written down there four possible barriers to our being visited from outer space. The first of them is that the origin of life might be very hard to arise. Well, I've already dealt with that. The second one is that technological life might be very hard to arise, to evolve, I should say. The universe may be full of life at a bacterial level of sophistication. That might be an easy thing to happen. Origin of life might be an easy thing to happen. But a subsequent barrier to producing the sort of advanced technology that would be capable of visiting us has not been uh, accomplished. It has been pessimistically suggested that technological life, when it arises, is extremely short-lived because it, con it, it almost immediately blows itself up. <laughs> so there could be little winking lights of technology going on and off around the universe. and going off before they have time to start uh, exploring s space. Or, fourthly, it could be that technological life is too intelligent to want to bother to visit us. <laughs> now, the principle of mediocrity can deal with all those, those barriers. We can do the same kind of calculation for technological life as we did for life itself. And we can come to an equally paradoxical conclusion. I'm going to refer here to, I think, one of my favorite science fiction books, uh, The Black Cloud by Fred Hall. Has anybody read The Black Cloud? Not many, okay, none, in fact, okay. <laughs> right. Strongly recommended, although the hero is a deeply obnoxious character. You have to just sort of get over that and, and learn some. It's one of those science fiction books where you really, really learn a lot of science in all sorts of, of different ways. It's like so, so much science fiction, it, it is about our being visited by a superior intelligence from outer space. And uh, if a civilization was technologically advanced enough to visit us, then it, wouldn't, then it would certainly have to be far more advanced than, than we are. No question about that. We are centuries away from having the technology for interstellar travel. And so if we are visited from elsewhere, we, the, the individuals, or whatever they are, whatever they call themselves, who visit us must be hugely superior to us. So superior that if we were ever to meet them, we would be gravely tempted to fall down on our knees and worship them as gods. But they would, of course, not be gods. And this is the important point that I want to leave you with. However godlike they might appear, they would surely obey Clark's, Arthur C. Clark's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. They would be even more advanced than us, than we are advanced over medieval peasants. And if we were suddenly to fly to the Middle Ages 
in a Boeing 747 and get out our laptop computers and our cell phones, we would undoubtedly be worshipped as gods. So the same thing would apply if we were to meet a superior technology. But it would not be gods for the very simple reason that this superior civilization, this superior spe species of life, would have to have evolved by some form of gradual process, probably, in my guess, rather similar to Darwinian natural selection. But if not Darwinian natural selection, then some kind of crane, as Dan Dennett calls it, as opposed to skyhook. You cannot suddenly conjure up out of thin air highly complex intelligence. If there's one thing we've learned, if there's one aspect of consciousness that's been raised by Darwin, it is that complexity, intelligence, everything that goes with it, has to come about by slow, gradual degrees from simple beginnings. It doesn't matter how godlike the aliens from outer space may be, they will have evolved or come about by some kind of crane, some kind of gradual, incremental, explicable process, as opposed to a skyhook. And that is what I actually said to Ben Stein. I, it, they actually didn't, didn't even cut that bit. They apparently didn't even realize that that was the bit to cut. Um, I made that point. Once again, I was uh, bending over backwards, and once again, it was a case of quote mining. The important point is that anything that could have the attributes of, of an intelligence, including gods, could not just happen. They would have to have come about by a gradual, incremental process. When I said that, uh, however improbable the origin of life might be, even if this is the only planet in the universe that has life, I was invoking the anthropic principle. I was invoking the idea that because we are here, we are alive, we are thinking about it, then however improbable the origin of life was, however improbable the origin of intelligence was, it has to have happened at least once, because here we are thinking about it. That I find actually a rather satisfying account. I don't believe it, because I think that life is much more improbable than that. But even if we are the only planet in the universe that has life, I myself am satisfied by the, by the anthropic principle for accounting for the fact that we have life here. That's the planetary version of the anthropic principle. There is a cosmic version of the anthropic principle, which is, for some bizarre reason that I've never understood, often invoked by religious apologists, who apparently don't understand that far from being a theistic argument, it is a profoundly atheistic argument. Some physicists have suggested that the universe, the laws of physics, the fundamental constants of physics, are fine-tuned in such a way as to bring us into existence. We have a message from outer space coming in. <laughs> there are physicists who will tell you that if you take about um, half a dozen physical constants, these are constants that physicists have no explanation for. They just accept that these numbers have the values that they do. And they then do theoretical calculations using their models to say if any one of these half dozen uh, constants was ever so slightly varied, then the universe as we know it would not be possible. Uh, for example, if the gravitational constant was a little bit different, there would be no stars, there would be no galaxies, uh, the entire universe would just be a uniform splurge of hydrogen, for example. You wouldn't have stars, you wouldn't have chemistry, you wouldn't have the formation of the, of the heavier elements, you couldn't have life. And they do the same trick for uh, half a dozen other physical constants. A good example is Martin Rees, the present astronomer royal, in his book, Just Six Numbers. 
If the universe, if the constants of the universe are indeed fine-tuned, how do we explain it? How do we explain the appearance that the universe is tuned to bring us into existence? Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. That, of course, is no explanation at all because it leaves unexplained the tuner. It's just pushing the, the problem back one step. So we can instantly discount explanation number one. Explanation number two is adopted by physicists, I think, Steven Weinberg, who was quoted earlier in this conference. Uh, Steven Weinberg, <coughs> Nobel Prize winning physicist from Texas, um, I think his view is that we don't yet understand enough physics, and when we do, when we have the longed-for theory of everything, the TOE, we will then realize that these knobs are not for tuning. There is no freedom. There are no degrees of freedom. Uh, there's only one way for a universe to be. But that might leave some people unsatisfied because it still seems a bit uncanny that the only way for a universe to be is the way that eventually gave rise to us. The third explanation is, I think, the one that's probably favored by... Oh, no, there are four, actually. Um, Victor Stenger, who will be known to and greatly respected by many people here, um, denies that the, that the universe is fine-tuned at all. And that's a serious point of view that we, that we ought to not forget. But assuming that it is fine-tuned, um, the final idea, which I think probably most physicists um, at least have some time for, is the multiverse theory. This is the theory that arises out of the inflationary model of the universe, and it suggests that uh, the, the universe that we know, the only universe of which we have any knowledge or any means of measuring, is a bubble in a foam of billions of bubbles, each one a separate universe. Is that me? Uh, each one a separate universe, and each one having a different set of physical laws and constants. So there's a vast range of universes with different laws and constants. A tiny minority of those universes have their constants tuned in such a way that the universe lasts more than a picosecond, lasts long enough to make galaxies, lasts long enough to make stars, long enough to make chemistry and to, make, and to let the evolution of life happen. A tiny minority of universes in this bubbling foam have what it takes and then the anthropic principle kicks in. Of that foaming bubble of all those, all those bubbles in the foam of the multiverse, we have to be living in one of the minority of universes that has what it takes to give rise to us because we are here. Once again, physicists find that a, a bit of a stretch. They find it not exactly implausible, but they think of it as a bit of a cop-out. I actually think it's rather an elegant explanation, um, and uh, it's, I, I, I think it's probably true, but I don't know enough physics to, to know. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just go on to the final um, science fiction speculation that uh, it, it's kind of rounding off this theme of the theological implications of science fiction. Another science fiction theme um, explored by Daniel Galloy, who is another of my favorite science fiction authors in um, his third book. I can't remember the title, sorry. Um, his 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 idea, and it's been used by others as well, is that our world may be a gigantic computer simulation in a computer elsewhere in the, in the universe. We are virtual creatures. We're living in a virtual world. Um, a kind of second life, uh, but a much bigger and better, grander second life. Um, I don't know whether you can rule that out. It may be philosophically absurd, but even if, it's, even if it were true, once again, we would have the regress. You cannot have complexity. You cannot have the sort of complexity to build a computer, to build a second life software to run us unless the creatures that built that computer 
evolved. Maybe they're also somebody else's second life, but sooner or later, regresses of that kind have to be terminated. You cannot suddenly invent complexity and intelligence. The only way to do it is to start from primeval simplicity and work up gradually. Darwin discovered one way in which you can go from primeval simplicity to prodigies of complexity, and who knows where that might end. There may be other ways. I, obviously, I can't imagine what they would be, or I would have won the Nobel Prize for suggesting them. But um, whatever they are, they are going to be like Darwinism, in that they are going to build progressively on primeval simplicity and work up gradually to the sort of complexity that's capable of living, that's capable of thinking, that's capable of building rockets that can go to other star systems, or that's capable of building a computer to simulate life. I'm going to stop there and pass on to part four, which is, no, I haven't really got time, have I? <laughs> um, five minutes, for, if anybody has questions, not necessarily about what I've said, but on my part four theme was to have been, if I'd had time for it, was to have been how to deal with creationists. Anybody got any questions they want to answer? There's a word that keeps uh, cropping up in, in some of your writings and even in Dr. Thompson, it, altruism. And it seems that, I, I'm not sure how the word is used in England, but having lived here in a very religious society, your idea of a your scratch, my back, I'll scratch, yours, uh, reciprocity, that's not the way people understand the word here. And since we can't seem to, nobody can agree on the word, um, and we're in the minority, should we just use uh, mutual reciprocity and, and, and abandon the word altruism? No, I, I don't see why we should do that. I, I think that altruism is a a word in the English language that people understand. Mutual reciprocity is an explanation for altruism. It's not the only one, necessarily. I think we need to keep separate the phenomenon itself from the explanation. Thank you. The question I need to present to you is, I, I come from a small town. The vast majority of people in this town are Christians, many of them fundamentalist Christians. I run a karate and yoga school there in which the vast majority of them are these Christians, and I spend no small amount of time explaining that bowing and yoga postures have no ecclesiastical significance whatsoever. Um, and <laughs> however, if I want to say what I'd love to say, which much of which I get from your writing, um, I wouldn't be able to enjoy living in the woods, raising my children in an excellent public school system, and a lot of the other things that go with living in a small town. So please, how can I put some of our clever bumper stickers on my truck and still <laughs> enjoy interacting with these folks? How can I, you know, the best you can get is a draw in a discussion because religion is embarrassing to the religious. It's so obviously a difficult problem which, which I'm not capable of solving. Um, I, I can only hope that gradually more and more people who think like you will start to recognize each other and it will start to become less unusual in a small town. And I think there may really be a critical mass phenomenon whereby once a certain critical mass numbers of people have been reached, it'll just suddenly go and then lots of other people, the dam will burst, and then lots of other people will, will realize that they've, actually they've thought like you all along. Um, I find that living in the southern United States, I'm surrounded by probably a higher population of creationists, or what I would call morons. <laughs> and I find myself talking to common friends about the, the debate between the two, and it seems what always happens is something very similar to what happens with you and Ben Stein, where they keep saying, well, how did that happen? Well, how did that happen? And they keep going on and on till we reach a point where I do not have the knowledge of biology to answer the question. And they tend to use that point of the argument and saying, aha, I got you. What would you recommend for someone like me who has a, a basic understanding of biology and evolutionary theory, but not a complex knowledge in dealing with that type of problem in a discussion? Well, I don't think that, that um, the detailed knowledge that you're, you're complaining of, of lack of actually is going to help anyway, 
because when it finally comes down to it, you are going to, you should be winning the argument because you are on the side of explanation in terms of true scientific phenomena that can be, um, that really can offer an explanation. They are caught in this regress that I've mentioned where they, they are simply looking for a gap in your knowledge and then saying God, God did it. But you finally get, get the last word by saying, but that doesn't help because who did God? I mean, you could probably put it better than that, but, but it, 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 it's never going to be an explanation. You, you can say, well, I, I'm not a biologist, so I can't give you the details of how the bacterium, bacterial flagellum evolved or, or, or whatever it is. But what I can say is that if there is an answer to that, science will find it. And your answer, the theistic answer, cannot be an answer. I have a half-sister that is going to one of the craziest local churches anywhere near where I live. Um, they actually preach things like the ludicrous story or is that fossils were placed there by the devil to test their faith and that black people don't have souls. I wish I was kidding. And she is a strong, devout believer in creationism. I was wondering if you think there is absolutely any hope for these people to get out of this mental hole in the ground that has absolutely no point to it. I didn't really hear that, but it sounds to me as though that might be a question for Dr. Thompson, uh, rather for, for, for a psychologist, rather than for, rather than for me. I'm from a uh, much more typical Bible Belt town, Augusta, Georgia, and I work in television news, unfortunately, in Augusta. And because our uh, target audience, our demographic is, is conservative Christian, we get away with a lot of Christian stories that otherwise we wouldn't be able to because that's our audience, 95% Christians. I know you've been on CNN and unfortunately Fox News, some other mainstream media here. Can you just tell me a little bit about what you think about the mainstream media concerned religion-wise in the United States and your experiences with that? I don't have that much experience. Um, I'm, I, I believe that the perception that the United States is a, an overwhelmingly Christian country may be exaggerated. Uh, Christopher Hitchens is certainly of that opinion. Uh, whenever I have traveled in the so-called Bible Belt, I have received, if anything, warmer receptions than I have in the um, nominally more civilized parts of the country. <laughs> um, and m maybe I'm putting too positive a spin on it, but, but my, in my interpretation of that is that there may be a lot more hostility to religion even in the Bible Belt, than many people realize. And once again, I come back to the critical mass phenomenon. It may be that there's just a sort of slumbering, not exactly majority, but a very substantial minority who are just waiting for the confidence to, to come out. And the broadcasting media will surely reflect that when it happens. But if, as somebody who's in the broadcasting media, I would encourage you to be courageous and to do something unpopular and actually don't just pander, don't just cater to the majority taste of your audience, but go out there and, and um, tell them what's what. Working on, I'm only 24, I'm getting there. Hi. All right. <laughs> uh, You've, you've done debates all around the world. Have you ever had a, I guess, a clever or a interesting argument from the other side? No. 